Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is part three and I think what it's going to be the final part of the Natalie Wood series of videos. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being patient with this video being released. I was out of town in New Orleans at CrimeCon, so I wasn't able to record. And I really thought that while I was there, I was going to be able to get some research done on downtime, like on the plane or when I was on podcast row and there weren't many people there, but it was just such a busy time from beginning till end. There was never not people around. There was never not somebody to talk to or somebody coming up wanting to talk to me, which is great, but at the same time, I couldn't finish my research for this video until I got back, so I couldn't record it until today. And that's just how the story goes sometimes. So without further ado, let's get right into the tragic life and death of Natalie Wood, part three. I know you can tell my voice still sounds very scratchy. I'm either coming down with something or getting over something or my allergies are just incredibly bad because my throat has been really, really sore for weeks now and I'm stuffed up and I'm not sure exactly what's happening, but if it doesn't get better by Monday, I'm gonna go to the doctors. But just try to bear with my um, husky kind of growly voice that I have going on. In September of 1966, Natalie was introduced to a man who would finally make her a mother. London-born Richard Gregson. Gregson already had three children from a previous marriage, and when he met Natalie, it was a right time, right place kind of thing. At the time, she was seeing another Brit, an actor named Richard Johnson, and she and her sister Lana sat and made a pros-cons list about the two men to decide which of them Natalie would end up with. When Natalie told Lana she had already slept with Gregson, her sister laughed and said, well, the decision is made then, isn't it? Natalie was ready to get married and have a child. It was something she had wanted for a long time. It took two years for Gregson's divorce from his wife to go through, and in that time, Natalie prepared herself for domestic bliss. She had decided she was going to step away from her career to be a full-time wife and mother. And as she flew around the world with her fiance, who was still having to do his work as an agent, she took tennis lessons, cooking lessons, she studied interior design. She said, quote, I had to have two years of just living, catching up, and I was thrilled to discover that I didn't have the need to work. There was a time when if I wasn't working, I felt at a loss. Gregson was an agent and Natalie hired him as her own agent and suggested him to her famous friends like Robert Redford, who Richard would go on to form a producing company with. During this time, she spoke about her husband-to-be in a very strange way. She said, we both have tempers. We have some stormy fights. There are periods almost as stormy as with Warren, but for now, the void is filled. It seemed as if even she knew Gregson was just a means to an end, a warm body to fill the void, to give her children. The two were married in May of 1969, and by early 1970, a 31-year-old Natalie announced she was pregnant and began nesting, decorating the nursery and hand-knitting baby clothes. Gregson spent the majority of her pregnancy flying back and forth from LA to London, where he had an office. And when she was six months pregnant and he was out of town, she went to a dinner party thrown by a movie producer and his wife. Richard Wagner was also in attendance at that party, and they were seated next to each other. He had become separated from his wife, which wasn't well known at that time. And a lot of rumors had been going around anyways about his marriage to Marion Marshall, that it was basically just a friendship kind of platonic marriage, allegedly used to cover up the fact that he was actually gay. Natalie and RJ talked the whole evening. They were catching up. They talked about their life together, the good old days. He followed her home that night, worried about her driving in the rain and her condition, being pregnant, and he walked her to her front door. They said goodnight, and when he got back in his car to leave, Wagner claims he drove around the corner, parked, and began sobbing in his car, just the way that Natalie had when she had been in the restaurant, when he had announced that he was having a baby. And she acted like she was brave and happy for him, but when she got in the car later, she cried her heart out. The next day, he sent flowers with a little note, just as he had done after they had had their first date initially. So many years before that, he'd sent her flowers with a little note, and the note was so sweet that Natalie cried. It's really such a sad story when you're married or in a relationship that you've invested so much in, and then it ends and you both go your separate ways only to find that the grass really isn't any greener anywhere else. 
RJ was estranged from his wife, and Natalie and Gregson weren't doing much better either. The honeymoon was over for them. Her sister Lana said about the relationship between Robert and Natalie, There was just something that Natalie could never get out of her mind about RJ. He was never gone out of her heart. On September 29, 1970, Natalie finally held her baby daughter in her arms after a natural childbirth with no complications. Unlike the bloodbath her mother had described giving birth as, she said it was the happiest moment of her life. She named the baby Natasha, a name for her that represented the last time she remembered innocence and childlike wonder. When she saw that Maria was up to her old tricks with baby Natasha, whispering things in her ear with that twinkle in her eye, she let her mother know that she had no plans in raising her daughter on the screen. She would have a normal and happy childhood. Nikolai, who was still around even though you would never know since Maria kept him in the background as much as she could, he loved his granddaughter very much, the same way he had loved his daughter, and he called her Natashinka. For a woman that had been searching for true love for so long, she would finally find it in her role as a mother. Anyone who is a parent will know that this kind of unconditional, reciprocated love is unlike any other, and there's nothing like it to make you feel and know that you've never truly loved or been loved before. And she felt that when she looked down at baby Natasha and realized how much she was needed, and in turn, how much she really needed. This wasn't somebody needing her to provide for them financially. This wasn't somebody who needed her to be on set on time or remember her lines or put herself in a position that she felt unsafe in. This was somebody who needed her fully, literally to be kept alive, but not only that, to be taught about love and kindness, to be taught the difference between right and wrong, to be taught how to be a good person, a kind person, to be shown the birds in the skies, and the flowers in the grass. Your role as a parent is so much more than making sure they have a roof over their head and food in their stomachs. It's about teaching them about the world and the people in it and their role in it. And she realized how impactful and important she now was to somebody and it changed her life. When the magazines interviewed her about her new life as a mother and wife, she said, quote, For the first time, I feel an inner emotional security. There is reality and dependability. My life revolves around Richard and the baby. But once again, Natalie would be disappointed by somebody she decided to revolve her life around. In the summer of 1971, barely a year after they had said, I do, Natalie found out something about her husband. The official story was that Natalie overheard an inappropriate phone conversation between Richard and his secretary, but others say they heard from Natalie that she had caught them together in bed, in the house that Richard, Natalie, and Natasha all shared together. She threw his clothes outside, ordered him to leave the home immediately, and at the same time called her lawyer to drop divorce papers. Robert Wagner happened to be in LA for a few days that summer, newly engaged to the 23-year-old Tina Sinatra, daughter of Frank Sinatra. He read about the divorce and the scandal in the papers, and he called Natalie to see if there was anything he could do for her, and basically just to tell her that he was there for her. In September of 1971, Natalie, her older half-sister Olga, who lived in San Francisco, and baby Natasha, who had just turned one year old, they went on a cruise around Sardinia. Natalie claimed she needed to get away from it all and she just needed a break, but when Olga saw her sister, she was shocked by her appearance. She had lost so much weight, her bones were sticking out of her skin. During the cruise, Olga claimed that Natalie talked about RJ a lot. She was still hung up on this fairy tale romance. The golden couple that they had been, that they had represented for Hollywood and for the world, and that she eventually attributed to who they actually were because it's so very easy to look back on something and remember the good times and put that relationship with that person up on a pedestal and you forget the things that they did that hurt you, especially when the new hurt that you're experiencing is so much closer, it's so much more fresh. You start to look back on you know, the old days or your past relationships in a more rosy and glowing light than they actually were. She wondered aloud to Olga if the call that RJ had made to her that summer was out of friendship or something more. When she got back, she began spending time with and being photographed with several high-profile men. There was a short period where she and Steve McQueen were being photographed together. She even went on a couple of dates with the then California governor, Jerry Brown. Weird. But throughout all of this, she was making 
and receiving calls from RJ. He was planning his marriage and his wedding to Tina Sinatra. She was throwing herself back into the Hollywood image, making sure she was seen with men who she could be photographed with, but they were still keeping in contact with each other. At the end of the days when they both went back to their own respective rooms, flash bulbs weren't flashing anymore, and nobody was asking, what's going on with your wedding? Or what's going on with your new boyfriend? they returned to each other. And by Christmas of 1970, Robert Wagner showed up to Natalie's house with an armful of gifts for her and for Natasha, who he had taken a liking to. And within a few weeks, the tabloids were printing the story that RJ and Tina had called off their wedding, there was no more engagement, and he and Natalie were back together. Hold on, I'm gonna get like a cup of tea because my throat is so scratchy and I feel like I sound like a person that nobody would wanna listen to. I could be telling you all of the secrets of the universe, where the fountain of youth is, where the gold is at the end of the rainbow, and I don't feel like anybody would wanna hear me because of the way that I sound. So let me get some tea and hopefully it'll soothe my throat, and then we'll continue this story. Okay, sorry, I'm back. It's a little bit better. I got my chai here. Well, let's get back to it. The new relationship between RJ and Natalie flourished, and now that Natalie wasn't that big of a star, she kind of retired from working so she could be a mother, he didn't have to feel emasculated by her success or his lack of success. Although the world would always and still see her as the Natalie Wood, she only acted in one movie in six years. It was called Bob Carroll, Tad and Alice, and RJ had found his home and his place on television. He starred in the ABC television show, It Takes a Thief, which was based on the Alfred Hitchcock movie, To Catch a Thief, and it ran for three seasons. Fun fact, one of my favorite old Hollywood legends, Fred Astaire, is actually in the third season of It Takes a Thief, I think for maybe four or five episodes, but I actually watched a little bit of the show, you can find it online, just to get an idea of what kind of actor Robert Wagner was at that time. Was he any good? He wasn't that good, TBH, but Fred Astaire was amazing, as always. But even though RJ was consistently working and Natalie wasn't, the scales were still unbalanced. RJ was in debt from a life of poor decisions and a divorce that he was paying for. The divorce had drained him, he owed back taxes it was a mess and Natalie came and bailed him out because she was very smart with money. She had had an issue with West Side Story where they basically asked her, if I can remember correctly, they asked her, do you wanna get paid up front or do you wanna take a smaller payday up front and then take a percentage of what the film makes? And she was like at that time, no, absolutely, I want a, you know, a payday up front, I'm not gonna wait and see how the movie does to get paid, which ended up being a very bad decision because as we know, West Side Story was a hit and it, it made a lot of money and she would have made so much more money had she taken that percentage. But it was a risk she didn't feel comfortable taking at that point in her life. Now as a grown woman, she had become much more business minded and business savvy and she vowed to herself to always kind of do her research and make an educated decision, not one that came from fear or emotions. So she had stored away quite a lot of money and she was investing it in places, she was, she was rich, okay? She had a lot of money. And RJ, he was broke. Nobody would have known from looking at him because he put on the whole I'm Hollywood royalty, I've got a lot of money kind of facade, but he was broke. She paid off all his debts. Now, this is not ever really said anywhere. And this is obviously my opinion. Allegedly, these are my thoughts that pop into my head. I have no proof, I have no evidence, but let's think about it for a second. RJ's married to Marion Marshall in what a lot of people thought was a cover up for his homosexuality or his bisexuality. And then, that's starting to go south. He reconnects with Natalie. He finds out that you know things aren't that great with Gregson, and then he keeps in contact with her and he kind of keeps himself there in her peripheral. Pretty much as soon as she's divorced from Gregson and he's engaged to some little 20 year old, you know, Frank Sinatra's daughter, he's like, oh, Natalie's free again. Let me show up at her house with a bunch of Christmas presents I probably can't afford. If it is true that Robert Wagner is homosexual or bisexual, not interested in women or not interested in being with one woman and still wants to explore his sexuality, could it be possible, knowing that he was in debt, knowing that he was desperate for money, 
that he thought, let me just weasel my way back into Natalie Wood's life because I know she's doing well and I know that she still loves me. Just a theory, do with it what you will. So to tell her family that she and RJ were getting back together, Natalie invited Lana and Maria to her house for dinner and they were all sitting in the dining room and she's like, I have something to tell you. And then RJ strolls in and obviously both Lana and Maria are shocked. They're like, what, uh, don't you remember what happened? When Lana took Natalie aside, privately and asked her why, Natalie responded, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Now I understand what that statement means. I understand that she may have just been saying it in a flippant way. Once again, allegedly, my conspiracy, my opinion, Natalie Wood had gone her whole life being abused by people, being used by people, allegedly raped by a big person in Hollywood who may be Kirk Douglas, taken advantage of by older men who dated her when she was 16 years old, cheated on by Robert Wagner, cheated on by Richard Gregson, who had become the father of her child. Was she possibly just thinking or saying, I know RJ may be gay or bisexual. I know he probably is going to continue to pursue that. However, I feel safer being with him when I know he's not going to rape me or hurt me or use me. At least he'll take care of me. I feel better with the devil I know, the circumstances that I know, rather than to go out into the world and fall in love with somebody again who will hurt me again in a way that I'm not even prepared for. Just my thoughts. Is that what she meant? Let me know what you guys think in the comment. Are you on the same page as me? But is that really the best way to go into a marriage? Is that what a bride should say about her groom before stepping out and saying, I do? He's the devil I know because he's still a devil, right? The fact that she said that before getting married to him for the second time, it haunts me more than almost anything about this case. It makes me sad that a beautiful, talented, kind, loving woman like Natalie Wood felt that she had to settle because the world out there was too scary and it just hadn't shown her that people could be good. When Lana pulled Maria aside, privately asking her, you know, what do you think about this? Maria was like, don't worry, he's been seeing someone, he's cured. Now, obviously, Natalie Wood's mother, Maria, she's not around to ask her what she meant by that. Was she privy to some knowledge that RJ had been seeing a therapist in order to cure himself of being a homosexual? Why would she have said that otherwise? And obviously we know that homosexuality, bisexuality, any kind of sexuality is not a disease or something you're sick with that you need to be cured from. It's just the way you're born. It's a, it's a lifestyle that you live. It's not anything wrong or bad, but in those times they did send people to see psychiatrists for being gay or lesbians. They did send their kids to camps where they would perform aversion therapy on them in order to convince them that they weren't gay. They would give people shock therapy to try to cure them of this ailment. So what did Maria know about RJ and what he was doing to try to cure himself of this that she felt comfortable enough with him marrying her daughter again? Or did RJ just tell Natalie when they were getting back together, don't worry, I've seen someone, it was something that I dealt with before, but I'm better now, so that she would feel more comfortable marrying him so he could maybe allegedly, possibly, you know, have access to her money. Allegedly, allegedly. Shortly before they got married, for the second time, RJ took Natalie on a cruise on the Queen Mary II. They were sailing to London, and once again, you have these dark waters coming in, this premonition from the Harbin Gypsy. Oh, by the way, guys, I don't say gypsy in an insulting way. I understand how the Romani people feel about the term gypsy, that it is insulting, it's almost a slur. But in this case, since the gypsy or the fortune teller who was referred to as a gypsy was from Harbin, China, I didn't feel like there was the same connotation because the gypsy or the fortune teller in question wasn't from the Romani people. If that makes sense, I obviously wasn't trying to be rude or condescending to anybody. I got a couple messages where people, you know, some of them were nice and some of them were not nice, basically telling me you should never use the term gypsy. It's insulting and it's horrible and you've insulted a, a bunch of people. Obviously, that's that, that's not what I was trying to do. I am a well aware 
of the the Romani struggle and how they feel about that word. But since this woman was from Harbin in China, I didn't think that it applied. But let me know if I'm wrong, kindly and respectfully, if you if you possibly can. Anyways, once again, when they're out on the dark water sailing to London, tragedy happens on the sea. They encountered what RJ calls one of the worst storms to be recorded out at sea for the past 100 years. And if you remember, when they got married the first time, they went on their honeymoon on the water, they encountered a really bad storm there as well. But all things considered, all the storms that they'd encountered while together sailing, all the prophecies that had scared Natalie into avoiding water for her whole life, on July 16th, 1972, the two got married on the water, borrowing a friend's yacht moored at Malibu. It was a simple wedding. Natalie and Natasha wore matching gingham dresses, and they had a picnic for the reception. And even though the boat rocked the whole time, making it hard for anyone to stay standing throughout the ceremony, Natalie and RJ began boat hunting right after their marriage. They wanted one of their own. Time on the water alone held that romantic glow from the past for them. She became pregnant with her second child, and Robert's second child, but their first child together. It was the summer of 1973, and she had started getting back into working, kind of a small projects here and there, a couple things on television. She turned down the chance to play Daisy in The Great Gatsby because of the fact that she was pregnant and she really wanted to be with the baby, the new baby, when she was born. I don't know if I've talked about this a lot, but Natalie Wood was an enormous F. Scott Fitzgerald fan. She loved The Great Gatsby. She loved the story. She loved the times. She loved the aura, the glamour, and she turned that down. So that shows you how important her family had become to her, much more important than any movie could be. And on top of that, she was 35 now, and she was reaching that point in Hollywood where it became kind of hard to be offered projects like that. 35's obviously not old, I'm 35, but in the world of acting in Hollywood, you become less in demand at that age. I think by the time you're like 25 in Hollywood these days, you're not in demand anymore, unless you're Meryl Streep. But she was happily anticipating becoming a mother again. So passing that movie up, it really didn't bother her. She didn't think, I'm 35, there may not be many more opportunities like this. She was thinking, I'm about to have my second child and there's never gonna be another opportunity to spend the first months of her life with her. However, this delivery did not go as easily as the birth of Natasha. The umbilical cord was wrapped around the baby's neck and she had to be delivered via emergency C-section after I think eight hours of very painful labor. Courtney Wagner was brought into the world and Natalie experienced that all-encompassing love again, but it would be the last time. She would have no more children, and she would be dead eight years later. RJ started working again in 1975, having settled his issues with the studio, but his career was to be one centered around television from that point on. He was working on the CBS series Switch, and Natalie was tending to life at home for the first time in a long time, maintaining a semblance of normalcy. 1975 was also the year that RJ and Natalie finally found the boat they had been searching for to recapture their newlywed days. It was a gleaming white 60-foot powerboat. They named it The Splendor, after the movie that was the crown jewel in Natalie's career. And the little dinghy attached to it was called Valiant, supposedly after the movie Prince Valiant that Robert had been in, which hadn't done so well. So basically it was like a joke, you know, the splendor was the huge yacht and that represented Natalie's movie Splendor in the Grass. And then Prince Valiant, or Valiant as the dinghy was called, was the little dinghy next to it to represent the failure that the movie Prince Valiant had been. So apparently Robert and Natalie had a sense of humor, I guess, about their unequal careers or at least their successes and failures relatively and respectfully, but, but that's why the boat and the dinghy were named what they were. Although the boat would later be the location of a horrible scene, it brought RJ and Natalie many happy years. They would spend almost every weekend aboard it with the kids. Natalie perched on the deck, wearing a floppy sun hat with a book while RJ and the girls swam. Once a broken young girl, Natalie had become a self-possessed woman, using the sad and tragic events in her life to strengthen her instead of allowing them to victimize her. She had two little lives that were depending on her to be a strong, sure, and dependable woman. And not only that, as a child who had witnessed the cracks in her own parents long before she was ready to, she knew she had to be a good role model for her daughters. I think it is very important to recognize that bad things happen to everybody. And obviously on a different scale, on a different level, what I've experienced in my past, 
it will obviously never be as bad as someone who has experienced more tragic things in their life, but we all feel our own stuff as deeply as the next person. Some people take the things that happened in their past and they grow up allowing these things to rule them, to control them, to victimize them, even though at the end of the day, once you've grown, once you're away from the people or the circumstances that did victimize you, it's no longer those things that are victimizing you, it's yourself. You're allowing yourself to continue to be a victim because you have the opportunity now to take that hurt, take that pain, turn it into a ball of fire and let it propel you forward instead of holding you back. And it's important to know that Natalie, I do believe she did this. A lot of things happened to her. She went through a lot in her early childhood and her teenage years. It was horrible, but she took all of that and she said, this is what I'm not going to do as a parent because that's what I had. This is what I'm going to give my children because that's what I didn't have. And I'm not going to be a victim anymore. And I'm not gonna let anybody push me around. I'm gonna become a badass businesswoman. I'm gonna have my own money. Nobody's gonna tell me what parts to take. Nobody's gonna tell me what scripts to read. I am my own person. And she brought herself to that from a very low place. And it's very admirable. By the time of Natalie's death in 1981, Robert Wagner was working full-time on a television series called Heart to Heart. And Natalie, after taking you know smaller parts here and there and dipping her foot into the pool of television as well, she decided to take on a movie starring a cross from Christopher Walken. The movie was a science fiction film called Brainstorm, and Christopher Walken was the new up-and-comer at that time. He was coming off of an Academy Award win for his portrayal of Nick in The Deer Hunter. So he was pretty much in demand. Everybody wanted to work with him. He was that gritty New York actor studio kind of actor that Natalie had worked with prior in such actors as James Dean. And I mean, he was handsome at that time. So even though I'm always gonna remember Christopher Walken as, you know, Frank Abagnale Sr. in Catch Me If You Can, Leonardo DiCaprio's father, and he was kind of like manipulative and kind of shady and sketchy and obviously much older. Just like I'm always gonna remember Robert Wagner or see Robert Wagner as Tony Donoso's father from NCIS. That is literally how I will always see him because that's how I saw him first, even though I've seen some of his things after while I was doing the video here. Tony Donoso's father, always. Sorry, RJ. But the Christopher Walken in 1981, he was handsome, he was charismatic, and he was a talented actor that Natalie was interested in acting with. But at that time, some of her old insecurities resurfaced. She was worried about her age and her weight. This would be her first film in a while, and she had spent the last few years becoming more and more comfortable with her role as Natalie, wife and mother. And she was concerned about the age difference with Walken being five years her junior, would the love scenes work and be believable? She began to eat less and exercise more. At first, their relationship was friendly but professional. But Natalie was creatively inspired by Christopher Walken's acting style. Like I said, very similar to James Dean. Very gritty, real, dark. On set during filming in North Carolina, the two became closer. Natalie had a rule that she followed where she wouldn't have more than one drink while she was working on a movie. But with Christopher Walken, she broke that rule to the point that wardrobe was constantly having to work overtime to accommodate all the weight she had gained from all the wine. She spent a lot of time with him going on walks, talking in his trailer, and by October, rumors had started to circulate that the two of them, both married with their spouses in different cities, had begun an affair. Allegedly, these rumors became so widespread that they reached RJ and Walken's wife, who both made surprise visits to the set to see for themselves what was going on. Now, the woman that Christopher Walken was married to in 1981, her name was Georgianne Walken. I believe they'd been married since 1969, and they are still married today, so I'm pretty sure that this woman, his wife, had no inclination that anything was going on and didn't think that anything was going on. And I'm pretty sure she said in interviews later that she never had any suspicions or once she saw for herself, didn't have any suspicions that anything was going on. But RJ was a different story. Most people that knew Natalie personally did not think that Walken and Natalie had a physical affair. She was much too devoted to her marriage vows for that. Sure, she had a, a steamy past where she was with many men, but she always was very clear about her stance on marriage, that once you get married, that's it, it's for life. There's no reason to search outside of that for anything. With Walken, it was more like a, an emotional connection, a flirtation, you know, kind of like 
you're married or you have a boyfriend or a husband, but you go to work and you spend so much time there, you develop a close connection with somebody there and they're like your work wife or your work husband. It never goes any further. It's just you guys hang out and talk, you have inside jokes, you flirt a little bit when you're at work. And I have to wonder if Natalie, who was at that point insecure about her age, and her weight, maybe not feeling as pretty and young and sprightly as she used to, just enjoyed the attention from Walken, a younger man, somebody who made her feel good and made her feel young and pretty again, and she didn't want it to end, so she just went along with it. That's very common as well. It was at this time, though, that Natalie started confiding to people on set a secret that she had shared with her hairdresser, Sugar Bates, two years before, that RJ was drinking, and he was drinking quite a lot. The constant drinking had started to affect their relationship. At the end of November, with the Thanksgiving holidays approaching very quickly and Brainstorm winding down, Natalie and RJ made a plan to go out on the Splendor on Thanksgiving weekend. Brainstorm was no longer filming in North Carolina. It was the last couple of weeks of filming, so they'd come back to LA and they were gonna do the rest of it on the soundstage. Christopher Walken was staying in a hotel in LA. Natalie was back with her family and they were gonna celebrate Thanksgiving because the holidays were incredibly important to Natalie. Everybody who knew her and was around for that says she went all out, you know, beautiful decorations, beautiful meals. She just loved the holidays and she loved giving her children the kind of holidays that you would see, you know, on Bing Crosby's White Christmas, just a kind of beautiful, picturesque holiday. They were very important to her, so she wasn't gonna miss Thanksgiving. They were gonna leave and go out on the Splendor on Friday. The whole thing with the holidays it's a memory that her daughters recall fondly even to this day. How happy she was, how she just got so into it. And I think that's what she would have wanted. You know, she made the holidays this special time and the special occasion so that her daughters would have those memories, and they do. So I think she would be very, very happy and satisfied to know that. Anyways, Christopher Walken also made an appearance at this Thanksgiving dinner. Like I said, he was staying in a hotel and they invited him because Natalie knew his wife was out of town. He didn't have any family around, so she didn't want him to be alone for the holidays. She also invited him to go out with her and RJ on the Splendor the next day. Now this was possibly to show her husband who had been constantly making passive aggressive comments about how her and Walken were into something. According to Lana, he would say things like, oh, is he looking up your skirt? Or just constantly making comments about their love scenes together and did she enjoy it to the point where it would make Lana very uncomfortable. So this had all been building up where RJ was clearly jealous, clearly worried that Natalie and Christopher Walken were doing something behind his back. So maybe she invited Walken on this trip to put her husband's mind at ease. So, you know, you can see us together. It's very platonic, we're just friends. Maybe she also felt guilty once again that he was alone on the holiday weekend and she wanted him to, you know, come and hang out with them. It was very common for RJ and Natalie to invite friends on the Splendor, co-stars they were working with on movies they were working currently on. It wasn't out of the norm. Personally, I don't know if I would have done it. If my husband suspected me of being in a relationship behind his back with somebody, and was so sure of it that he would make comments about it, I probably wouldn't have done that. To me, it's just inviting trouble, which as we know it did, but that's just me. They had also been planning on inviting a close friend that weekend, a female realtor, but she said it was cold. It's November, even in California, it gets cold in November, especially on the water. It was rainy, it was blustery, the weather sucked. She just didn't want to go out on the boat. She only liked going out on the boat in the summer when you could swim and do things. Otherwise, you're pretty much trapped on the ship. So let's talk about the mindset of especially Robert Wagner before stepping foot on the Splendor that Friday. We know he was already jealous and suspicious that something was going on between Natalie and Christopher Walken. On top of that, she was getting back into the movies and people were very excited about Natalie Wood getting back into the movies. And on set, people treated her like she was a star because she was she was viewing Brainstorm as her comeback, her door to get back in to the business. And Robert Wagner was probably feeling pretty insecure about that. RJ had always been insecure about her star status since he couldn't manage to get his own career off the ground, but now that he was on a successful television show, finally making his own name synonymous with something good, he may not have been eager to support his wife working on a project 
that might cause her to eclipse him again. Secondly, according to sources, he was insanely jealous of Christopher Walken, just as he had been with Warren Beatty years ago, a jealousy that had fueled him to drive to Beatty's house with a loaded gun. According to Lana Wood, the two would often bicker about Walken, with RJ making baseless accusations about what might be going on to the point where it made her uncomfortable, and he was outright resentful of the big name movie star he had married. One night, Natalie, Lana, and RJ were going to dinner, and Natalie asked where he thought they should go, to which he responded, you're the star, you decide. As a result of this constant verbal abuse and battering and bullying, Natalie changed, according to people who knew her. It's common for women in these situations to downplay their achievements, to dim their light, in an effort to make the insecure man that they're with feel more confident about his masculinity. It becomes the woman's job to reinforce their partner's man card, to defer to them, to be docile to them, to hide achievements and things that they might be happy about and excited about and want to share with their partner, but they know they can't because it's going to cause their partner, who is unable to be happy for them about anything that makes them more important or shine brighter, it's going to make their partner moody and then the rest of the night will be you know, miserable and they'll bicker and they'll fight. It's a survival technique. I know if I tell my husband that I've gotten this great opportunity, he is going to be upset about it and he's going to make me feel bad about it. And then he's going to be in a bad mood for the rest of the night and we'll fight. So I'm just going to hide it. I'm not going to tell him what happened. I'm going to listen to him talk about his stuff and his projects and his life and be happy and supportive for him, but I'll keep this to myself. Like I said, it's a survival technique. And I think that's where she was at that point. She just wanted a normal marriage, a normal life. She was married, she had kids, she had a career. She wanted to have all that and be able to be happy about it, be able to share it with her husband, but she couldn't. So she tried to have all that and keep the two parts of her life separate which wears on you and takes a lot out of a person. And as proud of Heart to Heart as RJ was, it was still just a television show. And there was a stigma attached at that time with television shows that people who took on a role in a TV show just couldn't cut it in the movies. And that's why they were on a TV show. Now today, there's many, many TV shows that I enjoy much more than movies. The acting's better, the storyline's better, it goes on longer, I like that. But at that time, it was kind of a joke. Like if you were in a TV show, you just couldn't be taken seriously as a serious actor. He probably felt like people viewed her as a big time movie star and they viewed him as a has-been, as Mr. Natalie Wood. And according to Lana, Natalie's sister, Natalie's 11-year-old daughter, Natasha, panicked when she heard that Natalie would be going out on the boat that weekend. And she begged her and cried and pleaded with her to stay and not go. Maybe this was just a little girl who was missing her mother because she'd been out of town for so many weeks in North Carolina filming Brainstorm. Or maybe Natasha was having a little bit of a premonition of her own. The only four people that would go out on the boat that weekend were RJ, Christopher Walken, Natalie, and the boat captain, Dennis Davern. Dennis Davern had been working for Natalie and RJ for six years. And over the six years he'd worked for the Wagners, he had become very close to them both. But to Natalie especially. She never went into the water, so while her family and friends splashed in the ocean, Dennis would sit with her and talk as she sketched, read, or did needlepoint. According to him, they became each other's therapists in a way. And after a while, they became friends. When she had called him and told him they were taking the boat to Catalina Island that weekend, he tried to deter her because it was freezing cold. But she insisted, so he made sure the boat was stocked with everything they would need. Food, clean linens, but especially liquor. It was their typical MO to sail out to Catalina and then imbibe once they docked there. Dennis claims that as soon as they boarded the boat Friday night, there was a tangible tension in the air, mostly emanating from RJ towards Christopher Walken. He put on a big show of showing off the boat to Christopher Walken, walking him around. This is where this goes, and this is what this instrument does. This is a compass. You ever seen one of these? You don't have a boat? No, I do. You know, kind of like peacocking measuring contest sort of thing. I have this big bow, what do you have? I mean, he was notoriously proud of the boat. When they bought the Splendor, he was quoted in a magazine telling a reporter, I know everyone thinks they have the boat, but just look at her. You know, very proud of this boat. But this, like I said, was on a whole new level, kind of trying to shove it in Christopher Walken's face. Look how successful I am, look at everything I have. Look at what a big manly man I am. As the time went on, the tension grew. 
Christopher Walken, he had two Bloody Marys and he was a New York boy, right? So he was not used to being on a boat and he started feeling seasick. So he retired to his cabin to sleep it off. When he got up, it was about 5 p.m. and they had docked at Avalon on the southeast coast of Catalina Island. Avalon was and is a popular spot for tourists and Hollywood royalty alike. A very bustling kind of town, lots of shops, restaurants, places to go, people to see. Dennis Deverne remained on the Splendor while Natalie, RJ and Christopher Walken took the motorized dinghy, Valiant, and docked at Avalon so they could hang out in the town for a couple of hours. According to RJ and Walken's later statements to the police, they spent the majority of the time bar hopping, and when they weren't drinking, they were spending money, as only extremely rich people on vacation can spend it. Christopher Walken walked into an art gallery and he was like, hmm, I like that paint, I will take her, wrap her up, and bring her to the Splendor. And Natalie and RJ were kind of walking around a jewelry store. Natalie bought Dennis Deverne an early Christmas present to surprise him with, and RJ saw Natalie admiring a one carat diamond necklace. The diamond was set into a sea barnacle and obviously on a chain, so he bought it for her. It was $5,000, but you know, whatever. Here's your barnacle diamond. <laughs> it sounds really cool, actually. I wonder if I can find a picture of it. The last stop of their evening was El Galeon, which was a popular waterfront bar with a nice outdoor patio. They had some drinks there, and then the manager at the restaurant noted that they went back to the Splendor around 10 p.m., so they'd basically been drinking steadily for about five hours. Allegedly, according to RJ and Christopher Walken, they wanted to obviously get in the dinghy to go back to the Splendor, but Natalie freaked out. She said the water was too rough, it was too dark, she didn't feel safe, she wanted to take a bigger boat back to the Splendor, but RJ had to basically calm her and talk her into it. They eventually did get in the dinghy and they arrived back at the Splendor. Dennis Deverne had dinner ready, but Christopher Walken, like I said, New York boy, not used to being on a boat. He hadn't gotten his sea legs in yet, was obviously full of alcohol, so he didn't feel like eating. He went down back to his room to take a nap. Now here is where things get as dark and murky as the waters that Natalie was so afraid of. It's going to get a little complicated. Stories change, people lie, people hide things. So I'm gonna to try to be as specific and keep you as, you know, on board and on the same page as, as I am. But if you have questions, let me know in the comments about this timeline because there's so many changing stories. There's so many discrepancies in everybody's story and it just keeps getting worse. So it can get complicated or confusing, but I wanna be as factual as possible, so let me know if you have questions in the comments. After Natalie was found dead, RJ spoke with the police for about roughly six minutes, not even a full six minutes. In this statement, he offered no information about what happened Friday night after they got back to the Splendor. Maybe he wasn't asked, but he didn't volunteer any information. During his first less than six minute interview with the police after his wife's found dead, Later, on December 4th, when he was interviewed again, so this is almost a week after his first initial interview, he claimed the sea was choppy, it had high swells, and there was a discussion amongst all of them to go back to shore and move the boat. According to that same December 4th statement, RJ and Natalie had a disagreement about whether they should move the boat or not. So he told her to go back to Avalon, get a hotel room for the night, and bring Dennis with her for company or safety. Apparently whoever interviewed him at that time didn't think it was relevant to ask RJ why he would send Dennis back to Avalon with his wife instead of going himself, or why Natalie had such a problem with moving the boat. Dennis Deverne's initial statement, taken in the hours after Natalie's body was removed from the water, also said nothing about that Friday night. It wasn't until his second interview on December 10th, sitting next to a lawyer paid for by Robert Wagner, that he essentially repeated exactly what RJ had said in his December 4th statement. However, the one difference in these statements is that Dennis claimed it was Natalie who said she wanted to go and get a hotel and had asked Dennis to come with her. Christopher Walken, who was interviewed when Natalie was found, also had two different accounts of what happened. Basically, in his first interview, once again, Nothing was said about Friday night, but when he was interviewed a second time, he claimed he heard some hubbub going on on the, on the boat deck. He was in his stateroom. And then Natalie came down, knocked on his door, and said, RJ wants to move the boat. And then after that, Dennis Deverne came down and was like, hey, listen, like they're fighting up there. Can you help me out? And 
Christopher Walken replied with some great advice, never get involved in an argument between a husband and a wife. And then he went back to sleep. Years later, when Dennis Deverne's guilt was eating away at him, allegedly he claims his guilt was eating away at him, he told a different story of what happened that Friday night. When RJ, Natalie, and Christopher Walken had returned from Avalon, RJ's mood had changed for the worse. RJ and Natalie did begin to argue, whether it was about moving the boat, Dennis Deverne says it was about her flirting with Christopher Walken, and that's when Natalie pretty much asked Dennis to take her on the dinghy and take her to Avalon. Dennis says he walked up to RJ and said, your wife has asked me to get her off this boat, and I feel like I need to because things aren't looking good here. So they take the dinghy back to Avalon, they walk back to Al Galleon. Natalie's holding a duffel bag, she's wearing a red quilted kind of down jacket the same one she would be found in when she was pulled out of the water. This was at about 11 p.m. It had literally just been an hour since she had left El Galleon with RJ and Christopher Walken, and now she was back with Dennis Deverne. She asked the manager, Paul Reynolds, when is the next boat to the mainland, and he told her there wasn't another one until the next morning. She asked him if he could help them find a couple of vacant rooms, and the bartender called a nearby motel and made reservations, while Natalie and Deverne sat at the bar and had a couple more drinks. They headed over to the Pavilion Lodge to check in. It was just a small motel, which was in, within walking distance from El Galleon, and the night clerk, her name was Ann Lawton. She reports that when Natalie and Dennis DeBurn walked in, they were so intoxicated they could barely walk. Natalie paid for two rooms, room 126 and room 219, and then she asked Ann, the night clerk, if she could get her some ice, right? So <laughs> this is a woman, Natalie's a woman who's used to things being done for her, essentially, you know, especially when they're out of town. She's probably used to these five-star hotels where everybody's just waiting to serve you and you're here at a motel and you ask the night clerk to get you some ice. So Ann Lawton was basically like, I'll show you how the ice machine works. So she walked over to the ice machine, showed her how it worked, scooped the ice out, and then she walked both Dennis and Natalie to room 126, opened the door, and then said, you know, can I walk one of you to room 219? And Natalie said, not at this moment, we'll find it later, thank you. And she and Dennis went into room 126 and closed the door. According to Dennis, at this point, he felt protective of her, like a bodyguard. He knew she was upset. They had become each other's therapist, each other's friend, and she didn't want him to leave her that night. So he stayed in her room all night and they basically just stayed up talking about all sorts of things. She wanted to call her sister, she wanted to get off that island, but most importantly, she wanted to leave RJ. Not just that night, but for good. She didn't want to be with him anymore. Once again, this is all according to Dennis Deverne, so I am saying it like it's a fact, and it is pretty much the only account of what we know happened at that time because Natalie Wood is dead, so Dennis Deverne is the only person who can speak on what happened at that time. But obviously, we don't know if he's being 100% honest. I just want to put that out there. That is what he says happened. So I'd like you to make note of a couple of things that I'm about to say because they may come into play later. The day after, Saturday night, when the maids went into room 219, they found it undisturbed. It hadn't been slept in, it hadn't even been entered. And in the original statements from RJ, Dennis Deverne, and Christopher Walken, they all basically alluded to the fact or tried to make it seem as if everybody had spent the night aboard the Splendor on Friday night, which obviously was not true because we know the police spoke to the people at the motel and they knew it wasn't true. So they knew that RJ and Devern and Walken had pretty much lied or at least misled them. When Dennis was confronted with this lie later and asked why, why did you guys say this? He said he would prefer to talk to RJ and a lawyer before he answered. For some reason, at around 8 a.m. on Saturday morning, hotel staff says Natalie Wood approached the desk and she had the key to room 219 in her hands and she said, oh, you know, I can't find my room. Can you guys show me where it is? And then she was surprised when she went to pay for the rooms and was told that she had already paid for them the night before. So clearly when she came into the motel the night before, she was so drunk she couldn't remember paying for the rooms. And why did she have the key to 219 and say she couldn't find her room? In my opinion, it was so that nobody at the motel would gossip and say that she and Deverne had spent the night together, which they did, but I don't think in a sexual way. I truly do think that he just stayed up all night talking with her. But this shows you how paranoid Natalie was about rumors and speculations and about maybe something getting back to RJ that might cause another outburst on his part. 
and Saturday morning, Natalie was still insistent about getting off the island. She asked the clerk when the next boat to the mainland left. The clerk told her, and she said, okay, I'm gonna head over to the docks now. When the captain comes down, she called him the captain, let him know where I am and tell him to meet me there, which Dennis did about 15 minutes later. Dennis claims that she had changed her mind about going on a public cruise to the mainland, and instead she wanted to get a seaplane, but for some reason, they couldn't find a seaplane. It's very sketchy and it's not really clear why they did not leave Avalon and go to the mainland at this point. Instead, Dennis said, well, you know, we can't get off right now. Let's just go back to the Splendor. Maybe things have calmed down. Everybody sobered up. In the light of day, maybe things will be better. We'll make breakfast and we'll see if this weekend can be salvaged. And she agreed. And it pretty much went just like that. Natalie and Dennis made breakfast. Natalie was famous, I guess, for making these Spanish eggs when she was on The Splendor for her guests. They made breakfast, everybody ate, talked, and they acted like nothing happened. They never even talked about it. But Walken did tell the police later that at some point that morning, after Natalie got back to the Splendor, she knocked on his door, woke him up, and said, you know, I'm gonna get a seaplane back to the main island. Do you wanna come or do you wanna stay? And he just replied, I'm not in this, and went back to sleep. By the time he got out of bed and ventured to the deck, like I said, Natalie was making eggs. Everybody was in a good mood. Everybody acted like nothing happened. Natalie seemed fine. She didn't seem upset. She told Christopher Walken that they had decided they were gonna move the boat after all. They were gonna take it over to Two Harbors because RJ wanted to do some fishing. Two Harbors is a very small, remote area of Catalina Island. It's got a permanent population of about 150 people. It has one restaurant one motel, and one general store. It's a vast difference between the hustle and bustle and the touristy kind of busy area of Avalon. They left Avalon at about 11.30 that morning. And RJ and Christopher Walken went back to their cabins to take a nap. And the way things went after, there's once again two accounts. According to RJ, he was awake he was fishing and Natalie and Christopher Walken approached him and they were like, hey, we're gonna go into Two Harbors. The restaurant there was called Doug's Harbor Reef, the one restaurant in Two Harbors, and they were gonna get some drinks you know, while RJ was fishing. And RJ was like, yeah, whatever, cool. Me and Dennis will meet you over there later with the dinghy. But according to Dennis, he and RJ were asleep when Christopher and Natalie decided to take a boat taxi into Two Harbor. And when they awoke, they were met with a letter that basically said, hey, we're at Doug's, you know, come over and meet us for dinner when you're ready. When Dennis and RJ got to the restaurant, they walked in and they could see Natalie and Christopher walking, sitting at the bar, laughing it up, having drinks, having a great time. By the time all four of them sat down to dinner at seven, they were all very buzzed. And by the time they finished two bottles of wine and some champagne and some mixed drinks, they were thoroughly drunk, all of them. The manager who initially sat them at the table, Don Whiting, remembers that he thought RJ seemed to be a little agitated with his wife. And according to Christina Quinn, the server who first helped at the party, Natalie complained about everything, the lighting, the table, the food. She was just generally unhappy with everything and eventually said, whatever, I'm just gonna drink my dinner. Christina Quinn, who was fed up with the antics of the table, handed the table over to a more experienced server, but everybody at that restaurant, the new server, the old server, the manager, Dennis Deverne, they all said that RJ kind of seemed to be simmering, like something was under the surface and it was just bubbling and bubbling more as the night went on. They all left the restaurant around 10 to go back to the boat and the manager who was worried about their level of intoxication called the Harbor Patrol and he spoke to Kurt Craig just to let him know that the party had left the restaurant they were pretty drunk and to make sure they got to the boat okay. When they got back on board the ship, Dennis claims he put the kettle on because he knew that Natalie liked to have tea before bed and he opened a couple more bottles of wine because that's what they were gonna do. They had planned on drinking some more when they went back to the ship. Although it's safe to say they certainly didn't need it. According to Suzanne Finstad in her book, Natasha, Christopher Walken would later tell the police that he and RJ had a small disagreement at this point. RJ was talking about how Natalie was away from home and the kids too much. And Walken basically came to her defense and said she was an actress. This is her job, it's part of her life. RJ didn't like that. So Christopher Walken stepped outside for some air when the discussion started to escalate. And when he came back inside, everyone apologized and seemed to be fine. And then Natalie went to bed because according to RJ, she was getting bored with the men talk. 
You'll often hear RJ describe the conversation that evening as a political debate. She just didn't want to talk about it anymore. But in the end, I think it's safe to say, with all the, the eyewitness accounts, Christopher Walken claimed and admitted that this argument was about Natalie's career. Dennis Deverne also backs up this statement. It wasn't really a political discussion, although Robert Wagner might have you believe that. And it wasn't until many years after this evening that Dennis Deverne would reveal something that is backed up by evidence, but was never spoken about before then. While Christopher and RJ were having this discussion about Natalie's career, RJ grabbed an open bottle of wine, smashed it on the table and said, what are you trying to do? F my wife? Obviously, Natalie at that point was embarrassed, ashamed, and angry with RJ. That kind of behavior is ridiculous, especially around a co-star and a professional acquaintance. So that is when she decided that she was going to go down to her room and go to bed. Now, according to Robert Wagner, he and Dennis and Christopher Walken sat there for another 15, 20 minutes talking, and it was Natalie's habit to kind of go downstairs, get ready for bed, and come up and say goodnight to everybody. But when she hadn't done that, by the time that Christopher Walken himself had gone to bed, RJ went down to see how she was doing. And that's when he found out she wasn't there. Dennis Deverne tells a very different story about what happened that evening after the wine bottle was smashed. Dennis said that RJ followed Natalie down to her stateroom, their stateroom that they shared together, and the two began arguing very loudly. He could hear them shouting, things being thrown around. It was pretty bad aware that he was kind of hearing something that was meant to be private, he went up to the bridge and put on some music, hoping that it would cover up the sounds of them fighting, but he could still hear them. So he went down to the stateroom and knocked on the door. Robert Wagner opened it and said, go away and closed the door. Dennis went back up to the bridge and within a short time after that, the fighting and the arguments ceased. So he went back down to check and make sure Natalie was doing okay, everybody was doing all right. And that's when he spotted Robert Wagner standing by the swim platform, basically the platform that the dinghy would be tied up to, the platform that you would get on and off the boat from. He was just standing there. And when Dennis walked over, he looked at him and he said, I can't find Natalie anywhere and the dinghy's missing. They walked around the boat, they were kind of looking around. There was a spare stateroom that the girls would stay in when they were on the boat, their daughters. She wasn't anywhere, and the dinghy was gone. Dennis got worried. Allegedly, according to him, he knew Natalie would never take that dinghy out by herself. She was terrified of water, and if she ever went on that dinghy at night, she would have Dennis with her. So he said, we've gotta turn the searchlights on, we gotta look for her, we gotta call someone. And RJ said, no, we're not gonna do that. Let's sit down and have a drink and figure out what we're gonna do. He opened up a bottle of scotch, he poured some for himself, he poured some for Dennis, and they sat there and they drank for a little while. Dennis claims that as this went on and nothing was happening, nobody was being called, they weren't trying to like figure out what to, what to do or what was gonna happen, he got more and more nervous that something wasn't right. To the point where he said he thought that RJ definitely had something to do with where Natalie was, to the point where he said he thought if he did try to call somebody, he might go missing next. Either way, between RJ's statements and Dennis Deverne's statements, it seems pretty clear that Robert Wagner knew Natalie was not on that boat pretty early on. At some point between 10.45 and midnight, he knew she was missing, but he didn't call anybody. He didn't call for help, at least not right away. Another boater named Warren Archer, who had had some interactions with the Wagners and knew them and had, had drinks with them before, he called RJ on the boat radio about 11 o'clock to see if Natalie and RJ wanted to come over to a party that he was having on his boat. RJ said no, but Archer claims he heard noises in the background that would suggest to him that RJ and Natalie were fighting. At this time, he claims he also noticed that the dinghy was tied up next to the Splendor, which was only about 30 yards away from his own boat. There were some other boaters close by that night that thought they heard something strange. John and Marilyn Wayne, owners of the boat Capricorn, just about 80 feet away from where the Wagner boat was, they thought they heard someone calling for help from the water. John heard it first, they were asleep, but they slept with their windows open and they had a silent generator. So it was definitely easier to hear things from their boat than maybe it would have been from other boats according to the Waynes. He thought he heard someone calling for help, a woman yelling, help me, please, somebody, I'm drowning. He woke his wife up and he said, Marilyn, go up to the deck, see if you can get a pinpoint on where this person is. I'm gonna call over to Harbor Patrol. 
Marilyn had her son's new digital watch with her, so she was able to keep track of how long they heard the woman calling for help. According to the Waynes, they also heard other voices coming from another boat that they couldn't pinpoint where that boat was. And they were calling back to the woman, yeah, yeah, we're gonna help you. Don't worry, just stay right there. Kind of laughing and, you know, almost taunting the woman who's calling for help. The Wayne's son, Anthony, owner of the digital watch, later, much later, gave an interview to Inside Edition where he backs up the story of his parents. He remembers the woman calling for help and he remembers the men's voices taunting her. He claims the men didn't seem drunk and he almost thinks that they just thought it was a joke or they didn't take the woman seriously. They didn't think she was in any immediate danger. Marilyn was trying to get an idea of where this woman who needed help might be. It's dark, everything's echoing, right? So she's calling back, where are you? Just let me know where you are, we're getting help. Can you tell me where you are? At one point she even considered jumping in and swimming around until she could find her, but her husband John was like, that's a stupid idea, it's dark. We have our searchlights on and it's still dark. The voice could be coming from anywhere because with the echo you don't know where it's coming from and it's freezing cold out there. It's just not a good idea. We'll keep calling Harbor Patrol. Now they made several calls to Harbor Patrol, but none of them were ever answered or picked up. The woman called for help from 11.05 till 11.25, and then there was silence. Although it seems as if the occupants of the Splendor knew Natalie was missing off of the boat from a very early on point, there was no call from the Splendor. According to Dennis Deverne, every time he mentioned that they needed to call somebody, they needed to get help. RJ said, no, we're not gonna do that. Not right now, we wanna keep this low key. And he poured some more scotch for Dennis. It wasn't until 1.30 in the morning that RJ eventually got on the radio and he basically sent out an SOS of sorts. This is the Splendor, we need help. Someone's missing off the boat. He didn't call the Coast Guard, he didn't call Harbor Patrol, he didn't call Baywatch. He just put out a random message on the radio. Someone's missing, we need help. Ironically enough, Don Whiting, manager of Doug's Harbor Reef, who had seen the party earlier at the restaurant, he was still awake on his own sailboat and he heard the message come through at 1.30 a.m. in what he calls a very slurred voice because Robert Wagner was drunk still. When he answered the call and he was like, what's going on? RJ told Don he thought Natalie might have taken the dinghy back to Doug's and could Don go check for him? Now, Doug's Harbor Reef was closed. It's a small restaurant on a small island where there's nothing happening. It's not a touristy place. It doesn't stay open till all hours of the morning. That place was closed. Why would RJ think that Natalie, terrified of water, terrified of dark water, would take a dinghy by herself to a restaurant that wasn't open, it was closed, where nobody was there? It was raining, it was pitch black, it was cold, the water was rough. Even Don Whiting, who didn't know Natalie personally, didn't know she had a fear of dark water, was kind of like, mm, chances of that are slim to none, but yeah, I'll check. At this point, the Coast Guard still had not been called. It was basically Don Whiting and another man, Paul Wintler, who was a maintenance man at a local campground on Two Harbors. They got a couple of local people and they began like searching around for her. Don Whiting went to the restaurant. Paul Wintler drove over to the Splendor to kind of get an idea of what happened and where he should look. And RJ asked if Paul Wintler would drive him back to shore so that RJ could look around for Natalie. While RJ was looking around for Natalie on the shore, Wintler got in his boat and kind of drove along the shore to see if he could spot the dinghy or maybe Natalie walking. About 15 minutes later, RJ flagged him down and he was like, did you find her? And Wintler was like, no, did you? And RJ was like, no, and he seemed really agitated about it, so they went back to the Splendor. At no point did Robert Wagner ever tell Don Whiting or Paul Wintler that Natalie was afraid of water and really couldn't swim at all. At 2.30 a.m., it finally dawned on this motley crew of volunteers that this was out of their realm now. This was like out of their hands. This was something that they could not help with. Don Whiting drove to Doug Odin's home, who was the harbor master at Two Harbors, and woke him up. I guess the harbor master closed early on Two Harbors, so that's why nobody was being able to get through to them, but they went to his house and they woke him up. He went over to the Splendor and he claims when he got there, everybody was just sitting around drinking, not really doing anything, just sitting around drinking alcohol. So he was like, what the heck's going on here? What happened to Natalie? Where is she at? Odin tried to get information about the dinghy. What did it look like? What kind was it? 
And even though RJ had an insistent before to everybody else that Natalie and the dinghy were both missing, so that meant Natalie was on the dinghy and she had to have had the dinghy somewhere, we're looking for both of them, he said to Odin, uh, yeah, it's not really like something she would do. It's pretty out of character for her to take that dinghy out alone. So, I mean, it just kind of like made sense at that point. She was gone, the dinghy was gone. So I just, that's why I said she was on the dinghy, but I doubt it, I doubt it. Not only did RJ tell Paul Wintler and Don Whiting that he didn't want anybody else called, that he was trying to handle this on his own, you know, with just the volunteers. He didn't want uh, Harbor Patrol called, he didn't want Baywatch called, he didn't want the Coast Guard called. He kept insisting to them, nobody should call anybody. And he insisted the same to Doug said, we want to keep this low key. You know, she's a high profile kind of person and we just don't want to raise a lot of alarm and be in the papers. After Doug Odin searched for almost an hour and there was no sign of RJ, he basically went back onto the boat and he was like, listen, I know you don't want anybody called, but this is crazy. She's missing. She could be in danger. We have to call someone. He told RJ, I'm going to keep your names out of it. Like I won't use your names, but I've got to call the Coast Guard, which he did around 3.30 in the morning. Baywatch was not called until 5.15 in the morning. Six hours after Natalie Wood had vanished off the Splendor. Six hours. Divers were brought in and the Avalon Sheriff's Department boarded the Splendor to ask some questions. The Valiant was spotted by the night manager and cook of Doug's Harbor Reef, tangled in kelp inside a little cave. The key was in the off position, the engine wasn't on, and the oars were still secured. A couple Baywatch lifeguards swam the Valiant out of the cave and used it to continue to search for Natalie. I guess they didn't know or think that that dinghy would possibly be evidence in a murder or a death because if they did, they probably wouldn't have used it because that's compromising it as evidence now. Natalie's body was spotted by an aerial team in a helicopter, floating just below the surface. They were able to see her from above because of her bright red parka. When she was pulled out of the water, she was wearing only an ankle-length flannel nightgown, wool socks, and the red coat. Her body was found floating a mile away from the Splendor. RJ was called to the Coast Guard boat that she had been brought to in order to identify her body, which is the typical job of the next of kin, but he claimed he couldn't do it. He couldn't see that. So he sent a Dennis Deverne to identify Natalie's body. Don't you think if it was you, if it was your wife or your husband who had been found drowned, you would want to see the body for yourself to make sure it was them to have one last moment to say goodbye? I think that's pretty typical. So what happened with the investigation, if you can call it that? We have discussed in past videos how corrupt and inept the LAPD has been and can be. This is a pretty much known fact. Well, in the case of Natalie Wood, I think personally they completely dropped the ball. They failed her in almost a worse way than they've ever done. Even to somebody who knows nothing about police investigations, isn't aware of how they typically work, no one would think that the LAPD in this case did enough. RJ and Christopher Walken were flown to Long Beach where the main detective on the case, Dwayne Razor, was sent there to question them. Once again, if you can call what happened a questioning. Razor claimed in his report that Mr. Wagner was in such an emotional state during the interview that they had to stop it. He claimed he was satisfied with RJ's explanation and he had what he needed. According to Razor, the sheriff's department saw what happened as nothing more than a big celebrity drowning. He said, I've got nothing so far to make me think that anything is wrong. What happened here is a starstruck police force making special arrangements and accommodations for a Hollywood actor. Remember, RJ was questioned for less than six minutes and a broken bottle of wine was discovered on the Splendor. And when asked about it, RJ said it had fallen and broken because of the rough waters. They didn't pursue it any further. And typically, if someone were to drown on a boat and the three people who were left alive, the only people around, were going to be questioned, they would separate these three people so they could question them separately so that they wouldn't have a chance to get their story straight. But before anyone was talked to, RJ requested that he and Dennis and Christopher Walken be given a couple minutes alone so they could talk privately. It is believed that this is the time when he made it clear to them what their story was, what they shouldn't say, and what they should say. What kind of investigation do you know where somebody drowns off a boat, the only three people left alive on the boat are allowed to meet privately together before they're questioned by police? Only when it contains two big time Hollywood actors. You had RJ, Robert Wagner, and you had Christopher Walken. This would explain why all three men's initial statements were so similar and so vague. The coroner for Natalie was Dr. Thomas Noguchi, 
famous in his own right for being the coroner to the stars. He had been on scene at several high-profile deaths such as Sharon Tate, Marilyn Monroe, Robert Kennedy, Janis Joplin, and the list goes on. And he has often been scrutinized for being a lover of that Hollywood gleam, seeking out the cameras and the spotlight himself during press conferences, and releasing too many personal details about the victims. He stated cause of death as an accidental drowning, ignoring many of the red flags that indicated foul play might have been involved. The general theory that the LAPD came up with based on RJ's statements was that the dinghy was banging against the boat while Natalie was trying to sleep and she couldn't sleep, so she got up to try and secure it so it wasn't banging anymore. Now, many people, friends of Natalie and RJ's that had been on The Splendor previously, did say that the dinghy had a tendency to come loose and then hit against the side of the boat. According to this theory, she put on her jacket, ventured outside, and made an effort to tie the dinghy to the Splendor more securely so it wasn't banging. Natalie Wood had a blood alcohol level of 0.14, which is quite a bit over the legal limit, and she also had some other drugs in her system. She had a drug in her system that was taken for seasickness and a drug in her system that was a painkiller. According to Noguchi, there was two other small pills in her intestine that hadn't dissolved completely yet, and the smell coming out of her gastric system smelled strongly of alcohol. So she was drunk, she slipped, she went in the water, and she drowned. Easy peasy, right? Let's wrap this up, guys. Let's go home. However, there are also several bruises on Natalie Wood's body. In the autopsy, it is simply stated that she had numerous bruises on her arms and legs, as well as a small abrasion on the left side of her face. How did they explain these abrasions and bruises? Well, they happened when she was trying to get back into the dinghy, of course. Now here's my problem with this. There's no way that Natalie Wood herself would have gone out and tried to secure the dinghy. She would have asked Dennis to do it, or Walken or RJ, somebody else. She didn't like being near water. She didn't like being near water at night. She had this insane fear of the prophecy from so long ago before she was even born. She wouldn't have done it herself. And even if she had been trying to get in the dinghy and leave the boat because, you know, RJ had made her mad, she knew enough about boats that she would have never gone into the dinghy after she untied it. She would have gotten into the dinghy and untied the ropes that held the dinghy to the ship first. That's, that's my problem here. I rarely go out on boats and I know that I'm not going to untie the dinghy and then try to jump into it from the boat while it's like being pushed away by the current. That's just ridiculous. Nobody would do that. Secondly, there was two ropes that were securing the Valiant to the Splendor. If she was trying to secure the dinghy so it wasn't banging up against the boat, would she have untied both of those ropes? and then tried to retie both of them? Or would she have untied one and then retied it tighter and then untied the other one and retied it tighter? It just doesn't make any sense why that dinghy would have been untied from the Splendor. In my opinion, even if RJ didn't have anything to do with Natalie going into the water, when he discovered she was missing, it would make sense that he untied that dinghy and pushed it out to sea as an alibi or a cover. And assuming that all of this happened, okay, she got into the dinghy and then tried to tie it back up and couldn't because it was moving too fast, or she fell out, or she untied the dinghy and then fell off the swim step, why would she have gotten these bruises on her arms and legs by trying to desperately crawl back into the dinghy when the swim step was right there? Right there. A much lower and easier kind of platform to crawl back up onto. Why would you try to get back into the dinghy? So how did she get into the water and how did these numerous bruises end up on her body? By the time she was pulled out of the Pacific Ocean, rigor mortis had not set in. Rigor will typically take between two and six hours to start setting into a body after death. And to be honest and to be fair, the cold temperature of the water would have slowed that process slightly. But let's just say she went into the water somewhere between midnight and 1 a.m. She was pulled out of the water at 8 a.m. the next morning. So that's still, if we're being generous, six hours in the water. Even with the cold water temps, some sort of rigor should still have been present in her body at that time. So how long was she alive in that dark water before she finally succumbed to death? Additionally, in my opinion, the bruises found on her body could not possibly have been from her trying to get back into the dinghy. And here's why. A bruise, after some sort of contact or some sort of trauma to your body, a bruise is gonna take about one to two days to start showing and to develop. 
And yes, post-mortem bruising can still happen, but the coldness of the water would have slowed that down as well. It leads me to believe that these bruises were put on her body days before she even stepped onto the Splendor that Thanksgiving weekend, which now begs the question, who put them there? Was she being hit by somebody? Was she being hit by her husband? Were they in an abusive relationship? Now, these are not accusations. These are just questions that I have in my own head based on the evidence I see. When the case was reopened in 2011, the new coroner on the case tended to agree with me. She said she believed that these bruises were put on Natalie Wood before she went into the water. After all of this happened, RJ flew back to his Beverly Hills home and he hid out. He didn't talk to anybody, not the press and not the police. And who did he bring with him? Well, Dennis Deverne. He requested that Dennis move into the Wagner home and Dennis agreed initially because he thought he could be a source of comfort to RJ and to the girls. But then it began to feel like an imprisonment. There was always somebody guarding the door, armed security 24 seven. And RJ said this was because of the media who were always trying to get close to the house. This security person was there to keep them out. But really Dennis believes now that that security person was there to keep him inside because he was not allowed to leave the house. And he wasn't allowed to talk to anybody. And as soon as RJ got home from Catalina Island, he lawyered up. And the first thing that he told Dennis to do when Dennis walked into the house was go right into his bedroom where RJ's lawyer was waiting and told Dennis, do not say anything, do not talk to anybody, and tomorrow you're gonna have your own lawyer assigned to you, paid for, of course, by Robert Wagner. You may think this whole Dennis was imprisoned thing sounds a little, you know, crazy. Why did he put up with that for so long? He was kept in that house for over a year. Well, this is what Dennis says. He was at first kind of happy about being there. He lived in a one room apartment with three other guys and spending time and living in a comfortable Beverly Hills mansion with a pool and just an endless amount of alcohol because RJ kept him pretty much liquored up the entire time he was there. He thought it was kind of like a vacation, but then Dennis's girlfriend, she wanted to see him. So she came by the house when her calls weren't getting through and the guy at the door said, no, you can't see him and he can't see you. And she, she kind of insisted and threw a fit. So Dennis went to RJ and was like, I really should see my girlfriend. Like, you know, a lot has happened. It's been a while and she'd like to see me and I'd like to see her. So RJ said, okay. And he had his security detail drive Dennis to his girlfriend's house. Dennis went inside, the security detail waited outside. When Dennis had been inside for about 30 minutes, they heard a banging at the door. They opened it and the security guys were like, okay, it's been long enough. We should really get going. And Dennis was like, it's been long enough. It's been like 30 minutes. I'm not finished. I still, you know, I want to spend time with her. And according to Dennis and Dennis's girlfriend at the time, they grabbed him by the throat and pulled him out while she screamed for them to let him go. They threw him in the car, drove him back to RJ's house. And that was that. Dennis also says that there was a lock on his bedroom door. When he went inside his bedroom in the evening, it was a magnetic sort of lock that would lock as soon as he went in and it could only be opened from the outside. Like I said, this sounds crazy, but this is what he, this is what he claims. And the first public statement about Natalie's death was not given by her husband. It was given by her husband's lawyer. He told reporters, apparently that night, the water was very smooth. It was like glass and she liked going out in the dinghy. She would do it a lot. When a reporter asked him if she would do it a lot at night, he replied, I don't know if she did it a lot at night, but it was nothing unusual. RJ just thought she went to bed and it was only when he went down there and noticed the dinghy was gone that he started to look for her. <laughs> now there's a couple problems with this statement, right? First of all, RJ told the police that that wine bottle had broken that night on the Splendor because the water was so rough. But now RJ's lawyer is saying the water was like glass. Additionally, RJ told Doug Oden, the harbor master who had come onto the boat that night before they called anybody, that it was very out of character for Natalie to take the dinghy, especially by herself and especially at night. He didn't actually think that she did that. But now his lawyer, after he makes that statement to Doug Oden, is saying she did it all the time. It was very common. And everybody who knows Natalie is like, what? She did what all the time? No, she didn't. That's crazy. On December 3rd, family and friends gathered to say goodbye to Natalie Wood. Lana was there and she confronted RJ and asked what happened. He had been avoiding Natalie's family just like he had been avoiding everyone else. And according to Lana, RJ responded, it was an accident. You gotta believe me before she was ushered out. So the police talk to RJ for like six minutes. They do a quick autopsy and then the case is closed, accidental drowning. They didn't check under her fingernails, which is pretty much forensics 101. And that's gonna be important in a minute. 
So what does this tell us? Did Robert Wagner have something to do with the death of his wife? He was the last person to see her alive. They argued right before she went missing off the boat and they were both heavily intoxicated that night. Afterwards, he gave a statement so vague with no actual evidence to back it up. And the police believed it, they believed it immediately. So how high, if this was a cover-up, how high did it go? Let's talk about who the President of the United States was at the time of Natalie's death, Ronald Reagan. Reagan himself was a Hollywood actor at one point, then a governor of California, until finally moving up to the highest office in the country. And he and RJ went way back. They were buddies. It's not anything new, right? It's a tale as old as time. The police and politics in Los Angeles have been known and accused of covering up things that actors and actresses and producers and directors do, including murder. Is it possible that RJ's old acting buddy, now president of the United States, would interfere with the investigation to make sure that there pretty much wasn't an actual investigation? Obviously, this is just speculation, but that is what some people say. And within two weeks after Natalie's death, RJ was being comforted by another actress, Jill St. John, who had been at Natalie's funeral and pretty much just, I guess, decided that he was free game now. They started seeing each other, according to eyewitnesses and people who were around at the time, around two weeks after Natalie's death. You know, right around the time of the funeral in the morning, they were together a lot. But their official start of dating was February 14th of that year, still only 10 weeks after Natalie died. This isn't really a long bereavement period for a man who was too emotionally distraught and upset to complete an actual police interrogation. By the way, Robert Wagner and Jill St. John, they got married, I think it was in 1991, and they're still married to this day. Congratulations, guys. It's hard to make a marriage last in Hollywood. Additionally, a friend of RJ's who coincidentally happened to be moored not 80 yards away from the Splendor at Twin Harbor that night, and who, also very coincidentally, was the senior coroner investigator for LA County, he was sent over to the scene to write a report for Noguchi. First of all, a friend of Robert Wagner's, it's a clear conflict of interest to even have him there. He shouldn't have been a part of that investigation at all. But furthermore, he wrote in his report that there were scratches on the side of the dinghy, which would confirm and back up the LAPD's theory that Natalie had fallen out and was trying to get back into the dinghy. However, like I said earlier, nothing was ever scraped out from underneath her fingernails, which could have proved that the rubber under her fingernails matched the rubber on the side of the Valiant, and that is in fact what happened. Additionally, many eyewitnesses who saw the dinghy claim that no scratches existed. They just were not there. And how about Marilyn and John Wayne? who heard a woman calling for help that night. They didn't come forward until years later because they claimed they received a threatening letter. A letter that said, basically, if you care about your health or you wanna remain healthy, you'll keep your mouth shut. Marilyn Wayne says it was from somebody very high up in the industry, somebody that she was scared of. Even now after his death, she says that that person was Frank Sinatra. Sinatra also wrote a letter to the coroner's office complaining that Noguchi was acting unprofessionally, giving way too many personal details about Nellie to the press, and Noguchi was fired shortly thereafter. Dennis Deverne himself claims to have been threatened a couple of times after he was no longer a prisoner of Robert Wagner's. He was still working on the Splendor, and a stranger walked up to him and said, yeah, you need to be aware of things, you know, randomly, and then walked away. After that, he got a phone call from an anonymous someone. This unidentified caller said, you better be careful about the things you say. And what happened to Lana Wood and Marie after the death of Natalie? According to Lana, Robert cut them off completely. She and her mother were not even allowed to see the girls, Natalie's daughters. After Natalie died, Lana tells a story about how she realized his birthday was coming up and she said foolishly she was worried about it and thought, oh, he's gonna be alone, it's gonna be his first birthday without Natalie, I better call him and you know see if something's getting planned. So she called over to RJ's and his daughter Katie picked up, Katie Wagner, who was the daughter he had with Marion Marshall. When Katie got on the phone, Lana basically was like, what are we gonna do, what's the plan, you know, we gotta plan something and Katie was, was basically like, it's fine, it's covered. We we're already planning a party. Don't worry about it. And Lana was like, okay, what, what's the date? What should I bring? And Katie responded, it's just gonna be his close family and friends. And Lana was like, yeah, I, I am family. It was pretty clear they didn't want her there, but she went anyways, and Robert basically froze her out, didn't speak to her, didn't look at her, acted like she wasn't there, and she ended up leaving. In Natalie's will, RJ was pretty much left everything, all her money, everything. 
which once again leads me to wonder if RJ did have a secret life that he was leading, if he knew he wasn't that great with money, and there would come a time when he was afraid of not working as an actor or he wouldn't have money. That would be motive to get rid of her because he knew he was gonna get everything she had. It's just my mind how it works, but that would be a potential motive that I feel like the police should have looked at, right? If this person happens to be on the boat with her, not only is his husband, and a lot of the times when a woman is killed, it's usually the husband or the romantic partner. Not only is this her husband, but he stands to gain an awful lot by her no longer being on the earth. Why is this not looked into? Anyways, he got pretty much everything, and Lana got all her furs and her clothes and her shoes. Lana and RJ would go back and forth a lot, you know, kind of in a catty way at each other, talking junk about each other in the press. I think this is just what these people do. Nothing is private. But after Lana got all these clothes, she said she just didn't have enough room. She wasn't rich and famous like Natalie. She lived in a small apartment. She was raising a child. She didn't have room for all the clothes. So she kept a couple pieces and she sold the rest. Then Robert Wagner accused her of selling her sister's things and just caring about money. But then Lana said that RJ auctioned off all of Natalie's stuff that was in the house. So pretty much they're both money hungry is what everybody's trying to say or at least what they try to say about each other. Lana also claims that a big reason why she sold those things was because she needed money. She had been working in Hollywood. I mean, she was a Bond girl. Lana Wood was an actress. She played in a James Bond movie. She was a Bond girl, so she got in some parts. She was interested in producing. Every time she went for a job in acting or producing anything that was part of Hollywood, she was turned down. She was being blacklisted by Robert Wagner. She couldn't get a job in Hollywood. So she had to make ends meet. She was a furniture saleswoman. You know, she worked at a doll and kind of hobby shop. She didn't have enough money to provide for herself and her child, and she needed to sell those things because she didn't need all those clothes, but she did need the money. So I'm not judging somebody. If my sister left me like five rooms of clothes and shoes, I can't imagine that I would keep all of them, not only because I might need the money, but that's just, you don't have the storage for that. So I can't really blame her for that. Now there's also a rumor going around that possibly RJ and Christopher Walken were involved in some sort of relationship. That's why RJ didn't leave the boat Friday night when Natalie wanted to leave and he sent Dennis with her instead, that he and Christopher stayed on the boat alone. And possibly that night, Saturday night, Natalie walked in on the two of them and it was like a flashback from what happened before. And maybe he killed her because he didn't want that to get out. He didn't want his reputation ruined. He didn't want to lose everything he had because he probably knew she would be thinking, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. She wasn't going to stay with him after walking in on that a second time. These rumors were possibly stemmed from a report that was written by a Roger Smith who was on that boat that night. The whole report is written in Roger's handwriting but there is a part of the report that's not in his handwriting that says, Walker and RJ were engaged in sexual activity. Natalie found them both together. Like I said, this portion of the log is in a completely different handwriting and Roger claims he didn't write it, but it could have been a different lifeguard on duty that night. So it's very mysterious and strange. And a couple of years after being on the Splendor when everything went down, being held hostage in Robert Wagner's house for a year, Dennis claims that he started to feel guilty. He started to feel the weight of what he knew pressing down on him. And he spoke with one of his friends, her name's Marty Rooley, and he told her everything that was going on, that there had been foul play, that he thought Robert Wagner was the one who did this to Natalie Wood. So Dennis and Marty Rooley decided to write a book together and people have accused them of doing it for the money. There was an interview, I can't remember when, I'll have to look it up. It, the interview's gone off the internet now, but there was an interview where Dennis and Marty were on a television show and when they didn't think the cameras were on, Marty said something about like, oh, this book is gonna make us so much money or something like that. She claimed that she was just being sarcastic because that is what she'd been accused of, so she's being sarcastic about it, but you never know. Marie, Natalie's mother, who had been taken care of by her daughter before Natalie died financially, she was displaced out of her apartment. RJ didn't think that Marie needed that big of an apartment and he gave it to his daughter, Katie, and he moved her to a much smaller apartment and he started paying her, I think, $2,000 a month to answer and respond to his fan mail. That's kind of messed up. I think that a man 
like RJ, who knew Natalie so well, would have known that Natalie wouldn't have wanted that for her mother to basically be forced into his employment uh, in order to survive after Natalie died. Natalie had been making sure that her mother and her sister were taken care of and she had enough money to do so, but RJ put a stop to that after her death. Almost as if to give her and her family a jab even after her death. The investigation was reopened in November of 2011, and in 2013, Robert Wagner was officially named a person of interest. The only thing is, since those first interviews, the last one being in October, on October 4th of 1981, Robert Wagner has refused to talk to the police. He won't do it. He just won't. Person of interest obviously doesn't mean a suspect, but it is strange because RJ, we know he lied about a couple of things that night. Why did he lie? If he was interested in his wife being found, why did he lie? He admitted in his memoir that he broke that wine bottle that night on the Splendor, but he told the police that it broke because of rocky water. Why did he lie about the wine bottle breaking? What was he worried about? Something so small at the time, if you look back at it now and you wonder why did he lie about that, it becomes much bigger. The bruising on her body, an investigator that was on her initial case, looked back at it and said, that bruising it doesn't look like the bruising of someone who falls in the water. That bruising looks like the bruising of somebody that was a victim of assault. Additionally, according to people who have looked into this case further since it's been reopened, during her autopsy, it was found that she had 300 cc's of urine in her bladder. And typically when somebody drowns or dies from drowning, they would expel that urine, but she had the urine in her system. So this becomes a very complicated and dark case. Was she alive when she went in the water? According to the fact that she went into the water at a certain time and was found at a certain time and lividity had not set in, you would think that she'd been alive in the water. Marilyn and John Wayne heard somebody calling for help. Was it Natalie? However, because of the bruising, especially on her temple, because of the fact that she still had the urine in her bladder, it would lead you to believe that she was knocked unconscious or maybe possibly even killed before she went into the water. Nobody knows. It's a big mystery. When Dennis Deverne and Marty Rooley were trying to find somebody to publish their book, they claim that RJ called every big publisher and said that he would sue the crap out of anybody who tried to publish it. So they ran into a kind of blackballing themselves. They found an indie publisher who wasn't afraid and, will, and was willing to do it. But initially they were met with a lot of pushback, basically trying to scare them into silence. Like you're going to get sued if you do this. And obviously if Robert Wagner had nothing to do with what happened to Natalie Wood, I understand him wanting to sue people. I understand him not wanting that to get out there, especially because her daughters are still alive and they're his daughters. It's just a bad, it's a bad situation. However, what I think is not mysterious and what is pretty clear to everybody is somebody's lying. Somebody's lying. What happened that night, especially that Saturday night on the boat, somebody knows exactly what happened. Whether it be RJ, whether it be Christopher Walken, whether it be Dennis Deverne. They all now have kind of different accounts. Christopher Walken doesn't really want to talk about it at all, which is suspicious on its own, in my opinion, because if nothing happened and it was completely innocent and, you know, she just fell into the water and drowned, why are you so held back from talking about it, I guess? But he doesn't really want to talk about it. RJ pretty much says, I've already said my piece, I've told you everything I know, and I'm not going to say anything more. And Dennis Deverne, who is the loudest and most frequent voice in this, along with Lana Wood, they both believe that Robert Wagner killed Natalie Wood. Somebody's lying, somebody's hiding things, and everybody's got a motive. Maybe money is a motive for both Lana and for Dennis Deverne. Lana did face some financial hardships. She does take money for speaking engagements and things like that. If that's your job and that's what you want to do for a career, that's fine. Dennis Deverne obviously might be doing this for money, but it doesn't mean that the story is not true. He just may be benefiting off the truth because he's the only one who knows it and is willing to talk. And RJ is staying silent and maybe his motive is to cover something up or to hide the truth. I mean, he's in his 80s now. He's not going to be alive much longer. I think at this point, the only possibility we have of clearing this up is some sort of deathbed confession from him or Christopher Walken. And hopefully they live for a long time. I'm not saying that they're getting old and they're going to die soon. Don't say that. But what I'm saying is I think that's the only chance at this point, unless they exhume her body, they check under her fingernails, they find any evidence that could still be there because forensic evidence and DNA evidence can survive for many, many years. There's no other way we'll find out what happened. There's just, he said, she said, his side of the story, their side of the story, 
and the truth which is hidden in those dark waters. This case is still open, like I said, so I will keep an eye on any new updates on it and we can talk about it during a Coffee and Crime. I will be aware of what's going on and if anything happens, we can talk about it. But for now, I'm going to finally end this part three. I hope it's not too long to put into a whole part because I feel like I've been recording all day. But we're gonna end part three. I'm going to say to you, thank you so much. Stay kind and stay beautiful. And I love you guys. Have a great day. Bye. Through the tears, light is faded. It's heavy heart.